melodies and the rhythm. Nothing will compare. One more time. One more time. I open the door. Why? You have a very powerful enemy. I wanted to survive. This will be the end of it. Take a good look, Tom. Because one of us isn't going to be here for long. One last deal to be done. Tommy! Then my Peaky Blinders rest. Peaky Blinders, the final series. Coming soon to BBC One and iPlayer. Hello and welcome everyone to this BFI at home discussion about the great Peaky Blinders. We now get into the final six series of it on BBC One and we have the key personnel with us. We've got Stephen Knight, whose idea it all was, who created it, who wrote it. Karen Manderbach, executive producer, Anthony Byrne, who directed the last um, the last season, series five that was, and uh, and the sixth upcoming now, and also a couple of cast members: Finn Cole, who plays Michael Gray, and Sophie Rondel, who plays uh, Ada Shelby. Uh, Sophie, I need to talk to you about your Birmingham accent. How do you go about nailing that? It's kind of working class Brummy made good, which is a very specific kind of accent, and you've somehow nailed it. How did you how did you develop that? <laughs> Oh, good. I'm glad. Um, it was a beast. That was like a right from the beginning. Because you, from series, series one, we weren't used to hearing that accent. I don't think there was any sort of particular references that we had. Um, my dad's from Coventry. So I had a little bit of it in our sort of family background in the sort of dialect. And then I took myself off to Birmingham and walked around following people, <laughs> listening. Um, and then it kind of morphed. And then I think naturally for Ada, as she sort of, as she sort of grew up and developed and, and bettered herself, and she was very keen to better herself and elevate herself, it was natural that perhaps she would try and lose some of that accent. I think people do um, when they're trying to sort of get away from their past. Um, and then when she's with her family, it comes back a bit more. So it's it's just about trying to keep that that those kind of vowel sounds. But it's such a tricky one. I think we all, all went off to Liverpool at points. All the uh, all the swearing that Stephen writes for you kind of helps, doesn't it? That keeps you rooted, even when you're living in the big house and so on. Yeah, definitely. And they always say that you always have a hook when when you're doing an accent, and it's a word that always brings you back. And, and swearing was quite. The F word, I won't say it, it was quite a, quite a useful one. So luckily it's peppered in quite frequently in the script. His brother, Thomas Shelby, says don't serve him opium ever again, or someone will write Arthur Shelby's name on your chest with a bayonet.
And Finn, the remarkable thing with you is that you started off as a little angel and you've got more and more into the Shelby way of things and got harder and tougher and nastier as time mm. goes on. So, I mean, it's showing your versatility as an actor. Was that hard for you? Um, yeah, it's always hard to show versatility as an actor. It's um, no, it was, it was, I mean, that's all thanks to Steve, I think, writing all those crazy ups and downs that he had to go through. Um, like you say, sort of grew up in this middle class upbringing, you know, posh family, good education, good family, and then got thrown in with this, uh, this, this lot. Um, but sort of felt like that's where he belonged. So with, I mean, you talk about accent, that was kind of where I, where I came from with that one. But, um, yeah, had to experience a lot in the last few years. So uh, it kind of explains where he is, why he is where he is right now. I think it's more fun to play more of a baddie. Definitely, definitely. And especially these kind of baddies in this sort of fantasy world where we get to dress up and look as cool as anything and and with these beautiful shots that our camera crews make, it's um, it definitely makes it feel a lot cooler. Now, now Stephen, when you started out with this, if I'd given you a crystal ball and said, this is roughly what season six is going to look like and be about, would you have had any clue? No, I mean, it would have been impossible to predict that what's happened has happened, but it's just become, um, it's just grown with every series, it's grown bigger. And in between the series, it grows bigger because of the nature of television now. So I'm still meeting people who've just discovered it. Um, and, you know, it's set in Birmingham, it's in the 1920s. Who would have thought that it would strike chords with people in Rio and Russia and China and all over the world? So no, I couldn't, I didn't predict this at all. Just so we understand the process of how it started, um, you had the idea and you kind of had the script. Where does where does Karen come into it? How did you two get together? What 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 does what, what does a producer do? And I don't mean I don't mean that pejoratively at all. What does this producer do? <laughs> um, a producer makes uh, real the dream of the writer, and uh, the kind of I've done long running series before, and so my expectation was different than Steve's. I expected that it was going to go on for a long time. So a producer appreciates the work of the writer. A, a producer hires Anthony. A producer hires Shaheen Beg to get these amazing actors. Uh, but you, having done, as an American, I've done a lot of long running series at the, at the core of it is to believe in it over time. So that's what a producer does and make sure that everybody is happy. And then thank everybody, obviously that's, and then try to get your money back. That's what producers do. <laughs> Stephen, it's an, it's an intensely sort of English thing, British thing. Did, 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 did you ever, since that Karen might be struggling with that, like we might struggle with, I don't know, something filmed in South Dakota or something. Um, I'm the daughter of a gangster and Steve noted that immediately. So right. I'm from Chicago, which is the equivalent to Birmingham in, in you know, its relationship to uh, New York as opposed to Birmingham's relationship to London. I made a hideous error in our first reading. Steve, I don't know, thank God he didn't, I don't know, faint, but I actually referred to uh, Birmingham as the North. Mm -hmm. right. you got to watch that. I, have, I had a learning curve, I just want to say. <laughs> no, I mean, it was never a, never a problem um, because Karen is Karen. And as she says, <laughs> from a background that is uh, very relevant to the people. And we did try to, or when we started this, it is English, but it's sort of un-English in the way that we execute it. And it is a bit of a Western and it is a bit of a gangster movie. So well, the one thing you would say about it. A long running series has uh, very relatable themes in it. And the relatable themes are uh, a, a guy with a ba an interesting backstory uh, and then uh, family, you know, everyone's got one. Romance, you know, everyone's got one. And ambition, that's why we're so popular all over the world is because all those themes are relatable well, you know, everywhere. So Anthony, there was some pressure on you when you came in as director of season five, I mean, in football terms. It'd be like somebody taking over at Manchester City now when they've won everything year in, year out, and then some new guy comes in. Um, you know, it's it, there's pressure. You know, there's we, we, you, you've got to be a bit careful, haven't you? Did you feel that kind of pressure? Um, a little bit at the beginning because I mean everybody kept saying that, so you know that that does <laughs> and uh, and everybody was saying it at the time, and I I was maybe a couple of months 
into prep on Peaky when, when the BAFTAs happened. I might be off with my timing, but I was definitely on board when the BAFTAs happened. And, um, and so then off the back of that, then yeah, it's a, it, it's a huge deal to come in. Um, but you have to just sort of put it to one side, which is really what I did. And I had a really good bunch of people that I had brought onto the show who kind of were a breath of fresh air. And I had a very clear idea and intention with the, what I wanted to do with uh, the show. And Steve and Karen and Killian were all on board with that. And the show was sort of about to pivot in a different direction. Um, so I just really focus on the story. And if you get lost in the story, then you forget the noise around you. But, it, but what you just said was quite interesting because when we were in pre-production, there was quite a few of the new crew who came on and some new HODs and they sort of let that get to them. And then you had to go and have other sort of side conversations about sort of letting that go. And you've got to sort of, you know, settle yourself and just concentrate on the story that we're about to tell. It must be tricky to honour the look that has got the series so far, but kind of put your own stamp on it. Is there any scene that you could point to which sort of shows what you did as was distinct in series five from series four? Um, I can't think of a scene off the top of my head, but I, I remember I thought it was like it's a Western shot as a graphic novel and that I certainly wanted it to be darker. And Steve and Steve was writing really more about sort of the character, the psyche of Tommy Shelby, let's put it that way, where season four was a kind of overarching gangster epic between the Italians and the Shelbys. Um, and I think that opening shot up on the moor, on Saddleworth Moor outside of Manchester, and it's a, you know, Tommy Shelby on a black horse riding in silhouette, um, that sort of was me sort of laying out my sort of stall and, and taking it sort of aesthetically in a slightly different direction. What is great is that there was, there was total creative freedom and confidence, uh, particularly with Killian, who, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis is the person that, that I'm building a relationship with uh, the most. And he loved what we were doing and, and kept pushing for that to, you know, go further with it. So that was, that was really all you need to sort of hear as, uh, as the new guy. Stephen, before I go back to Sophie and Finn, I'm trying to understand the process. You create a character and then you hand this character over to the actor. And then the actor works with that. And then I suppose the way they do it in itself informs the destiny of the character. Is, 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 is that the case? And did that happen? It, it, it is absolutely the case, particularly in the case of Michael, uh, Michael Gray, who... When I was, I tend to not know where I'm going when I'm when I start writing something. So I, I start writing a scene, and take the character scene by scene, and, and find out if you like who that character is from what comes to you through your fingers. If that sounds makes any sense. With um, the character of Michael, he was innocent, he was nice, and I, you know, you occasionally read stuff that fans are writing, and they, we don't trust him. We don't trust him. He's going to betray the family. And he put doubt in my mind. And I thought, well, maybe he is going to betray the family. And before I knew it, he was betraying them. So <laughs> that was an absolutely a, an evolution of a character that came sort of through the keyboard, if you like. And because he's such a brilliant actor, he um, has moved from he's moved from one to the other without changing what he does. But everybody knows it's different. But are you saying this betrayal? It's, it's been a, a treat. And, but did the betrayal come through something deep in Finn's heart, do you think, or it was just like other people saw it? Um, what was great about it was that I always think a surprise is only a surprise if you as the writer don't know about it yourself. Yeah. Because if you know it's going to happen. So if I'd known from the beginning that when he meets this kid from this little village that he was going to be a bad one, then it would have been obvious. But because I didn't know, then it wasn't obvious. And I think he's learned from the family how to behave and you would say is it you know genetics is he born like this is he made like this but asking those questions is always fantastic and with um sophie you asked sophie about the accent i remember the very first read through 
that we did a table read with all of the actors before we'd shot anything. And at, then at the end of the read, I went to Sophie and said, which part of Birmingham are you from? <laughs> Seriously, I don't know if you remember, but I, I was just so convinced that you were from Brum. And so, the, again, the, the evolution of the character of Ada has come completely, I hate this word, but organically, if you like. It's, be, it's happened as a consequence of watching what the actor does and seeing that Sophie, you know, in episode one, she's shooting rats with a pistol, you know, and she's tough as hell and she's, and, but in the performance you saw, there is someone who is tough as hell, but is, is too smart for this, who's going to, he's going to develop, he's going to do something else. So yes, the, the performance informs the destiny without a doubt. So, Finn, when, when did you first see this character, so to speak? When you, what was your first insight? The words on the page, presumably, and then then what happened? How does it work? Well, it was. It's funny you should ask that. I've been doing a couple of interviews today and, and had to talk about this. And um, the early days when I first read these scenes around the audition, sort of the time where I was when I was auditioning, I had this thought where I where I, where I thought, well, one, I wonder if I just sort of play a young Tommy Shelby in this and see how that comes across although he's innocent it's sort of in his genes somewhere and and i'll never forget steve said to me in season two he's he's always said the younger generation of the peaky blinders the younger generation and it's and it's interesting because that's turned out to be tommy's biggest threat in recent seasons is this this new way of thinking um this more legitimate way of thinking and michael's always had that he has the education he has the ability to talk to the upper classes and, and whoever. And I think that that is a, is a threat to Tommy deep down and, and, and that's been growing throughout. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's, it, it, it sort of came from day one. You know, you step into those suits and you're on set with people like Killian Murphy and Helen McCrory and you, and you really learn, you know, how to, how to behave and how to perform. And it's just been a bit of a baptism of fire, but, I mean, growing up with these guys and learning from these guys is just is incredible. And you have to learn very quickly. Sophie, what about your first sight of the shooting of the rats? And you, you crack the accent as we've established. When did you first start getting the feel for Ada? Um, well, I, this was one of my first jobs out of drama school. So I got the, um, I did a self tape for it. And I remember getting the, <clears throat> the character breakdown and it said um, Ada is the youngest sister and stuff and and, sh and she's feral and I remember thinking oh, I've never gotten a character description where they described her as feral and I thought well that's so cool um and then I just remember I, I I've talked about this before but I hadn't really done much else before so I kind of assumed that every job was <laughs> as cool as this and there was this kind of energy about every job that you went on and it's only now that I realized this was kind of really special and when I got there and they would, the way, I remember halfway through shooting the first series, they put up a huge screen in the studio that we're filming in and, and showed us stuff that we were getting and everybody was really excited because it just had this, this punk energy to it that I don't think anybody else was making. It's definitely not like any other period drama I'd ever seen or been in. So it was, it, I mean, I was really naive at the time. I was just sort of blindly going on along with it, but but I hadn't heard lines like that. Like I hadn't, I hadn't heard language like this or, or seen the kind of what was going to become the iconography of Peaky Blinders on, on any other show. And it was so exciting. So who, uh, Karen, who gets, the, who gets the credit for casting these brilliant people? That must be you, I assume. No, it's, it's Shaheen Beg, our casting director, about whom not enough can be said. Also a Brom, by the way, and uh, an extraordinary talent. To the people that she finds... Sophie, by the way, was the first person to be cast, just not to put too He didn't join us till season two, episode two. But it's all the, the villains, uh, you know, the lead villains we do cast. So all the baddies, you know, we do, you know, we do cast. And a little shout out to all of our baddies. They were the greatest baddies ever. <laughs> Sorry, but you just don't get better baddies than Sam Mueller, Adrian, or any of them there, or any of them. They were all so brilliant. So we're just uh, fortunate like that. And Anthony, how much is in the close-up? I'm thinking particularly of Tommy here. He does things with his, moving his, like his cheeks or his jaw by about a quarter of a millimetre, and it just expresses 
you know, pages of text, really. Yeah, I, I mean, we, we end up doing some of that in the edit. Sometimes you're, you're, um, you're holding back dialogue in order just to concentrate on a look, you know, that so much is communicated in a look. I mean, I know Killian's face really well at this point and, and <laughs> certain angles uh, um, just above his eye line, sort of three quarters, that's the kind of the sweet spot. Um, but you can, I mean, he, he's such an incredible looking guy. Uh, you can really put a camera anywhere on him and he looks great. But what Killian is uh, amazing at, and it's, I think the, the, the sort of magic of great screen actors is, is stillness. Um, and he does, uh, he communicates so much by doing very little. Um, and I think some of the great, great screen actors uh, are real masters of that. So it's a joy to watch that happen in front of you. You, my friend, are going to drink a toast. You will raise your glass to the poor people of Mykonos, whose lives you bastards have destroyed. Drink it. Hey. Drink. You're not leaving this bar until you have raised a toast to the people of Mykonos. Okay. Okay. I understand that today of all days, you would be angry. But if you had read my card instead of Bernie in it, you would realize that this is a misunderstanding. Now, I've been very patient given the circumstances, but you need to sit down and let me read my newspaper. Good morning, we are. Now, I said something to Killian, and he didn't really understand what I was on about, but I'll, tr I'll try you with it. And it was something Martin Sheen said about playing the president in the West Wing. When he said, you can't play the president of the United States on your own. You can only play it with the help of other people deferring to you. It's a way how other people defer to you that made you the president. And I, I just wondered, Sophie and Finn, if you felt that was the case with, with Killian. I mean, God is brilliant. But unless you react appropriately to what he's doing, it's, it's not going to wash. I mean, how much did you think about were you aware of that? So, yeah, that's so smart. I think you. I think you do absolutely, and you have to get rid of any ego because everybody wants to be the coolest and have the coolest response. Yeah. But you, you're part of this story, aren't you? You're, you're the sort of advocate for your character, but you are part of the narrative as a whole. And Tommy has to be the 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 coolest one, and 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 you have to defer to that, and and that's very easy to do when you're working with someone like Killian because as you say he has that stillness he has that natural sort of authority and kind of mythology about him with there's something just so intrinsically watchable about him so it's 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 very easy to defer to him but yeah I think you're totally right it is he is only this this sort of hero he's only this 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 figure by what everybody else says about him and how he moves through a room and everything it, I suppose it makes it complicated. Both both you and and Finn begin by deferring to him completely, almost, especially you, Finn, and then gradually find ways of taking him on in, in different ways. And that's, I mean, that's the tricky bit, I suppose, Finn. Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd agree with everything that Sophie said, and and obviously we have to give again credit to Steve for for giving us the lines that that allow us to to perform that, um, but. To go back to that, to Sophie's point of, you know, Killian's discipline and um, and sort of research on set, and the same with Tom Hardy and, and, and Helen McCrory, you know, these yeah. are people that are so good at what they do that you feel intimidated working in a room with them anyway. So it works for the character. Um, we're all living these these characters to a certain extent. And um, and that's part of the fun of it is to be intimidated by these people. And uh and uh, yeah, they, they do it so brilliantly that it doesn't really, you don't really feel like you're acting. You feel like you're in a room with a, with a scary person. But what's <laughs> nice is that we're all playing family. So within all of that, you get that really enjoyable push and pull that 
like I feel it you know he's Tommy Shelby and he's incredibly intimidating and authoritative but at the end of the day he's my brother so there's that lovely little sort of dynamic of yeah but I can just pull you down a peg or two and then it's that kind of you know that back and forth that makes the show so enjoyable isn't it ultimately yeah it's head poncho but you can just try and get a dig in every now and then but I've been like re-watching the show. I've been re-watching the seasons in, in order for the last one to be the most special one. And I look at like Sophie and Killian's relationship has always been like that from the very beginning. She's got something about Aunt Polly and her and there's, that's always been there and that's always been pulling at, at Killian. And I think that like that, that dichotomy is always exciting. Whereas that's for, the, for the guys, it's especially someone Michael who, like Michael who looks up to Tommy we we definitely live in fear of that and uh, and what he says goes you know what's nice is is when the women question him and he hasn't really got an answer for them it's that <laughs> that makes the show that's the kind of beating heart right that's why we love it my fire put some fucking hair in your chest Oh boy. <laughs> now, give us all a poem before we go. Wanna hear a poem? Wanna hear a poem? What about you, Brain Box? I was angry with my friend. I told my wrath. My wrath did end. I was angry with my foe. I told it not. My wrath did grow. And it's from the poison tree. By William Blake, you won't have heard of him. Meeting over. I should make the point about I make the point about Killian. He wasn't for a minute suggesting when he didn't get what I was saying with the Martin Sheen thing. I think I wouldn't say they didn't think you're you know you're all a brilliant. He made that clear, but he was especially brilliant about how Helen was great to work with. I mean, he explained it very well. He said she just seemed to sort of elevate every scene. She sort of found things in it that you didn't know. That you, you you wouldn't have known were there. Um, I mean, which of you two, which of you two had more to do with um, Helen? I suppose that would be. Well, I suppose you, you you both did, didn't you? But Finn, you had a lot uh, a, a lot of scenes with her. Um, yeah, I think Helen taught me. I mean, my first ever scene was with Helen, and um, I learned more in that scene than I'll ever learn in in the rest of my career. And that's that's no exaggeration. She the she taught me the finer details and, and, the, and the bigger questions, if you like, you know, the main thing to always question everything. And, and like you say, the reason that she elevated everything was because she had an idea for every eventuality. If you threw anything at her, she had a way around it, a way to, to make it more interesting. And, you know, you work in a scene and, and, and I'm sure Soph would agree with me here is that you work in a scene with, with Helen and it was, during the scene you're coming up with things that you never even thought were there and that that is credit to someone you know you're working opposite someone who you look up to someone who is fun and 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 powerful and full of energy and 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 taste that you want to impress them at all times and and but also you feel so safe to to try whatever you want to do and that's something that i'll cherish and i'll think about for the rest of my career because it's rare that you get to work with 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 an energy like that, with people like that. So um, it'd, it'd be great. I mean, that's amazing to hear. But it'd, it'd be great to get kind of an example if you can think of one, a specific example. I can give you, yeah, I can give you an example from my experience. So we cast Helen uh, as Polly because you know you would, and so that was you know just we had one person for the role, and it was it was her. But I had not met her. So I walked. I forgot where we were, maybe Liverpool. And I walked up and I said, "Hi, I'm 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 Karen." And the producer and uh, I wondered, and this was totally Polly. I was channeling Polly at the time when I said to her, 
when's your birthday? And she said, it's August 17th. And I said, mine too. And we didn't speak about it ever again. She said, oh no, then she said, then we're going to be friends. And I said, yes, we are. And we were. And it's interesting. And, and what about you, Sophie? Where, I mean, the craft, the craft of Helen McCrory, how could, if somebody asks you for an example, what, what do you give? Well, she, I think what was amazing about Helen is that she was old school. Like her background was theatre and she did the work. She came, she was deeply respectful of the script and yet managed to bring something more to it. And I remember really early on, she said, she asked me about like what I did with the script and she, she talked about how she really did use all her drama school exercises still. And she thought about motivation and what's your, what's your objective and all this stuff. And that's so unusual. You so often you get actors, particularly in TV or film, that just turn up and they just kind of do it and they work that way. But Helen's work was really muscular and it was really sort of, she thought about it, she had ideas and she was totally alive. So you could never phone it in with Helen. If you did something, she'd bat it back in a new way and she had other things going on and she wanted to talk about it. And she really pushed you, you know, it wasn't just an easy ride with her. They didn't, you didn't say cut and then she'd be chatting about, you know, if you'd watched Love Island the night before, she really went there and cared. And I, that's that's so rare. And she was, she was just so cool with it. She just had this confidence, this kind of this grit in her. Like she kind of always knew something maybe you didn't know. I feel like that's what she brought to it. That was why it was so exciting to watch her and terrifying and intimidating, but joyful to work with her because you were constantly pushing it right until you'd finished the scene. I suppose, Steve, that in a, in a writer stroke creator with an enormous ego, that not that you're that man, but it, it, would, it would present challenges having a, an actor who's really questioning and thinking all the time. It, um, was it ever a was it ever a challenge or you know was was it all easy to work? It, it, the only um, if you're a writer with an ego, the only challenge is when people start to change the words, which is not what you want. But an actor like Helen, they don't need to change the words. They don't need to change the scene because what they bring to it changes it anyway. So she created Polly from the first moment she was playing that role, and so no, I mean it. You just revel in the fact that you are handing your script. I mean, it's not just Helen, it's the cast. You know, you're handing your script to people and you're in safe hands and they'll take it and run with it and do stuff with it that is just extraordinary. But what's not happening is, which can sometimes happen if you write in a feature or something, where the script becomes a blueprint rather than the script. Whereas um, with something like Peaky, it's not. Um, and the actors, are, are so good that the thing they bring to it is something that is just absolutely chemical. And Anthony, looking through the monitor at, at Helen, how did you see it? What, what made a special from your angle? Well, obviously your reputation um, and what Sophie said sort of reminding me as well in terms of, you know, not, you know, she was ne never going to phone it in. So you always had to bring your A game as well and be ready um, and I remember quite clearly or vividly standing outside uh, on a location in Manchester where she was dressed in this incredible uh, black suit dressed like a gangster that Alison McCosh our costume designer had uh, created for her and I remember walking up to her and she was leaning against a Rolls Royce uh, with sunglasses on and it was kind of this weird blurred line for me of just going oh, who am I talking to you know am I talking to Helen McCrory or am I talking to Polly Gray and I think Helen McCrory was kind of wrapped up somewhere <laughs> in this sort of silhouette and it became one of the kind of main images of um, of season five um, and certainly in my in my head but um, I think that was that kind of perfectly encapsulated it. I mean, I'm, I'm wary of giving anything away, Stephen, but I, I've only seen the first episode of series six, and I don't. You kind of you managed to do Aunt Polly justice with the send off, so to speak. Did you agonise about that for a long time? Yeah, I mean, we didn't have a long time to agonise, and it didn't need to be agonised over, I think, because, I mean, the, the tragedy is, is the loss of the human being. 
which completely dwarfs the tragedy, which is the loss of the actor, which is the loss of the character. But um, in terms of the world of Peaky, she's still there in terms of you feel her force, you feel her effect, and always will. She'll, uh, Aunt Polly will never not be part of what the Shelby family is. Um, but we, we, we had to find a way to honour the character and in so doing, it sort of been that reflection into the real world, honour the actor. Um, and I hope we've done that um, respectfully. And uh, Karen, doing your, your thoughts on this, on her craft and her as a person? Uh, you know how some people uh, really do leave an impression on you, uh, whoever they may be, someone on your, you know, maybe a family member or just somebody randomly that you meet, it's because their spirit is alive. And, and she was playing a gypsy who had um, extraordinary feelings and whether, so she had strong beliefs. And so part of what she was playing wasn't, uh, well, it may not be our belief, but we believe she believed it. So her spirit literally, when, when you act with her or, or, or you write for her or you direct her, her spirit was overwhelming because it was alive. The spirit is alive, not just the, external or the externalities of whatever she was being or doing or the, uh, you know the exposition that she sometimes had to do there would have been something much more about her that she was the spirit <laughs> she so that was that's an odd thing to say but of course her spirit's going to linger because she was playing a spiritual being so in general what's the period like between filming a series and it going out. I mean, do, do you spend much time worrying about it? I mean, let, let me ask you that, Sophie. I mean, I mean, I would because I think, oh, what's everyone going to think? I should have done that. I didn't do that. Or do you just have to sort of leave it? I I totally leave it behind because if I don't, I just fall off the cliff edge into just horror. Because <laughs> right. I'm always mortified when I watch it back. I think I'm going to see Ada Shelby and then I see my face and it's horrifying. And so I think you do, you, you can really agonise or like, and I always wake up at four o'clock in the morning thinking that's how I should have done that line. Oh my God. But, um, but I think that way madness lies. So this, I'm just really looking forward to it because people, every day somebody has been asking me, when is it coming out? What can you tell me? Tell me something. So I'm just relieved that I can actually tell people a date and <laughs> not be not be sort of like trying not to give away the secrets anymore. And uh, what, what about you, uh, Finn? What do you, did you give it much thought? Well, uh, I know I know we're in safe hands with, with Anthony and, and Steve looking over it. So, so, we're, so we're in safe hands, but yeah, of course, I'm the exact same as Soph. I, I wake up in the middle of the night and I go, oh oh god this would have been so much better had i done this or oh. or that but one thing that killian does so brilliantly is he he's he holds he holds <laughs> the show show up and 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 you can rely on him to for the consistency um we're here to serve uh you know different purposes for different characters but um that's something that someone we can always rely on and why it's so important to have such a, a consistent disciplined lead i suppose anthony you are a bit like a football manager in the sense that you know, with the manager, all the players go home and the manager's got to stay behind, trying to buy and sell players, plotting tactics, worrying. I mean, you're, they go off and leave you with the rushes. So yeah, you've got yeah, to move for a long time. I'm sitting in a, in a post house um, here. Uh, I'm actually reviewing the master of episode one. That's what I was doing. So, um, yeah, it, it, it doesn't feel like it's going to finish, even though it's going to finish, but I've been on it. I think it, when when it finishes, it will have on season six alone. It will have been uh, almost two and a half years for me. Yeah. Um. So I'm still working on it, and so I I see I see Sophie and Finn every single day, and Killian, and so it's very weird. Then when you kind of come out of that process, it's very and you and you have different memories as well. Still keep you know. Uh, coming up as as I kind of watch it again and there's you know stuff I was just watching episode one of the opening before I came in here uh, to sit down with you all and uh, just watching that opening um, and the transition from season five and um, and how we how we resolve uh, Helen and Polly at the uh, at the beginning and you know it you just you're still you're still processing it all 
you know, mm. and processing the shoes as well. You know, <laughs> it's a long, a long thing. So when does the boss get to see it? Because I suppose production-wise, Steve is the Tommy Shelby of this operation. I mean, when does, when does the scary man come in and declare himself happy or unhappy? And all the hard work is done. <laughs> I'm invited to do a Prince Charles style um, yeah. inspection. Now, I mean, it, it's it's uh, early. It's it wouldn't be considered to be early because when when I see it, it's pretty similar to how it's going to look when it's on TV. There's certain technical things that need to be done and grading and all of that stuff and ADR, but you get the shape of it. And with Peaky, I have never sat down in that small room, watched the rough cut and felt disappointed, or oh, this needs major work. For some reason, this charmed project, this lucky project, I think of it as, um, always seems to find its own way of being fantastic. I mean, it must, there can't be much better as a writer than seeing your words made flesh. I suppose there can't be a worse feeling than it coming out not as you wanted it, but it sounds it's always been the former, not the latter with Peaky Blinders for you. With Peaky, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in, you know, when you first start in this business and you see a rough cut of anything, you're horrified because it's not pictures that were in your head. You gradually get used to that and that wears off and you understand that what you're going to see is going to be a different version. But interestingly with Peaky, it's, it, it is the same as the dream, if you like. You know, the, the, the thing that's in your head when you're writing, the pictures that you imagine, it looks like that, um, which is always really um, gratifying. And if I may say so, the, this series, series six, more than ever, is at a different level. And Callum, what do people around the world say to you about this? I mean, most of my mates are Brummies, so they would like it, wouldn't they? But there's... <laughs> but there's you know, it just, it's, it's got a, a reach far beyond what anybody might have expected. Yeah, that, actually, you know, very much so. And I wanted to say thank you to Steve for what he said, because my goal is to make uh, manifest his dreams. And, and if it lasts for as long, it is, that is the goal. So now a lot of other folks have uh, uh, cottoned on. We lucked out for one reason, which was as we were exploding onto British media, even past the Brummies, um, we had social media and we were able to manage the social media so that it, it used to be like word of mouth. Now it's, you know, 80 billion TikTok views or whatever it is. And it's literally giant. But also we asked a company called Parrot Analytics to tell us like who likes us and why, you know? And so these are the most well-respected analytic companies. And I could give you a statistic, which is um, since 1919, since 1999, since 2019, the the um, the views, the demand views, have gone up every single year. 19, not 2019, 2020, 2021, even among people who've you know hadn't seen it before, have seen it. It is um, it means something. You don't you don't get that to, meaning. It it matters. You don't get a demand view without it affecting a person. They just want to be peaky. They want to have something to do with it. They want to be part of that crew. They have weddings. You know, we've got the ballet Rambert. We've got, you know, uh, the kind of uh, things that everybody wants so that they can feel like they're a part of it because it touches them. If there were a metric for feeling a show, we'd be right up there on the top. So okay. our, our, goal, our goal was achieved because people feel Steve's dream. Um, which territories does he do particularly well in and, and why? You'd be surprised, actually. Um, it's really quite interesting. Um, South America, um, uh, India, Turkey, um, where? Everywhere in Europe, uh, you know, America, obviously. So um, our, the, our first undiscovered, um, we didn't know among uh, African-Americans. We we're off the hook. Uh, so many young women, uh, maybe it has something to do with Killian Murphy, I don't know, but in, in, a, um, <laughs> in a real world sense, we were surprised. Anybody who uh, owns a, a cell phone, uh, people who like cryptocurrency, I mean, extraordinary. Not leaving many people out there, Karen. It's the, the yeah. <laughs> it, it, but you wouldn't think, a, a, you know, you wouldn't think a story about a gang, one of five in Birmingham at the time, would be so appealing, but because of the structures that are built 
inside, which is, as I said, if you, if you talk, Steve always talks about head, heart, and balls. You know, if you talk about head, heart, and balls, everyone's got them. And, and the, you know, the head stuff is ambition. Everyone wants to be better than the sum of their parts or better than their lot. Everyone wants a, a, an appropriate family <laughs> or something, you know, one that they can deal with. Everyone wants a love interest. So because of the relatable touch points, and I think uh, largely because of Steve's prescience in terms of what actually is happening in the world, Mm-hmm. Whether that's luck or prescience, I don't know, but we keep moving in time and everything he says is going to happen is happening. So maybe he's a little bit of a Aunt Polly. <laughs> now, you, you mentioned balls. You need sort of balls to know. I meant balls and the kind of like. Oh. No, I know, but, it's a, but you need to know kind of when to bring it to an end or when to move it on. I mean, in television, it's very easy just to stick to a winning formula. Yeah. You know, so Steve, how do yeah, you. Balls you, change, you know. But how do you sort of curate it so it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't do that. It just doesn't run you know, out. The love it. interest parts. That's the that's Steve's yeah. brilliance. That that's just somebody who knows how to start a relationship, how to end one. You know, how to confuse one, how to throw a bomb into one. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but quite uncool in that. Um, I don't really want to, um, you know, end it while loads of people still want it. No, we don't want to do that. We want to keep it going. It's a world, and it's a world. We'll the world now. Immersive and theater. Want you know. it, right? So there'll, there'll be a film, and then something will will, will go yeah. out of that. Yeah, yeah. On the back of that, the crew, everyone, everyone since the beginning, the crews have loved working on Peaky. This is weird to mm. use the word love, but not just the actors, but the crews fucking love it, and I can't. I, I can't explain it except for they know they're part of something special. This is everyone. They believe it, that they're part of it, they're proud of it, and they want to transact with people who also love it. So it's a, it's not just a job. Yeah, it, it is a it, love it thing. It means something. If there was a metric for meaning, you know yeah. what I mean? It would be right up there. Go on, Sophie. No, it is a love thing. because I, I mean, I came back to finish this series. My son was four weeks old, and that was objectively a mental decision to make. Yeah. But I did it because... I, <laughs> Very bad parenting, but I, just, I, I, I love this show. I love being a part of it. I have yeah. loved being a part of it for 10 years. So it, it and, and Karen's right. I think there is that feeling on set. People are really love being there. They want to be there because they feel like they're making something that doesn't come along every, you know, every five minutes. So it's, it's a really special thing to be a part of. Well, I, well, I felt special just being part of this. So I don't know how, uh, I don't know how special you lot must feel being part of that. I love it. So uh, thanks very much for that. Absolutely uh, fascinating. I need to say, if you enjoyed this discussion, remember the BFI is a charity. And if you'd like to be generous enough to donate, that would be marvellous. The details of how to do so will be on your screen shortly.